Uh, thanks for joining us for our session today. Uh, so, uh, our session is Modernizing Security for Government Data Centers. My name is Dennis Gezi. I'm the Director of Secure Intelligent Cloud Strategy for our Microsoft State and Local Government team. And uh, with me today is Chuck Ladd, who's going to be uh, moderating the, the chat area for any questions that might come in. And also with me is Dean Iacovelli, the Director of Secure Enterprise for our State and Local Government business. So Dean, welcome, and let's get into uh, why we're here today, and let's talk about you know why we're here today, and actually more importantly, uh, maybe what it, what is this session going to be about, and what isn't it about? Yeah, you know I'm going to go all Simon Sinek uh, on the folks on the call. First of all, thanks for joining, appreciate it. Um, oops. We went back. Uh, so I'm going to start with the why. This is a 30 minute session. I feel like this might be the most important slide in the session. <laughs> um, so there is a large, we have 30 minutes. I'm going to say this a couple of times. There's a larger cross cloud security conversation to be had. This is not that. Um, so the focus for this session, and hopefully that was clear from the, the title, is focus is going to be on Azure and data center security because um, what we find when we talk to customers particularly government customers dennis and i uh, and chuck all work exclusively with u.s government customers um, and so what we find is there's is there's a massive temptation when people begin to make the wonderful magical move to the cloud um, particularly around infrastructure as a service is that um, there's a trap there which is to just lift and shift the vms you already have etc exactly as they are to the cloud and what you end up with is what we kindly like to call your mess for less uh, in security as well as in general and uh, how could we avoid that the other piece is and did i mention we only have 30 minutes um we will cover we're going to focus on a piece that you can't just step over or skip over and go to the fun stuff. We have to decide on how does our approach, how does our strategy need to change, uh, in particular to government, I think. Um, how does it need to change for us to expect or get to and expect different and improved security outcomes? Um, I promise you at the end, we will have a set of very meaty, very meaningful, more detail-oriented, more technical follow-ons or potential follow-ons after this session. Um, so the question we're trying to answer today really is, how do we, because during the move to the cloud, tons of moving parts, whether you like it or not. There's a ton of moving parts. How do I leverage that as an opportunity, since everything's moving anyway, to move to the cloud in, an, in a particular approach, and we'll discuss what that approach looks like, as an op using that as an opportunity to improve my security outcomes along the way, since I'm going to be moving stuff around uh, in, any, in any event. So that's, that's so sort of the spirit of today's call. So Dean, in, in the past, one of the common ways that our customers approach security issues was more people and more money. Is that something that works in today's landscape? I'm going to say on the whole, um, that's not a realistic approach anymore. And it's up to me to make that case. And that's what we're going to do on this slide, if we can bring up the first uh, data point. So I've, div I've divided this slide into sort of thoughts on a threat landscape and then thoughts on almost the other side of the coin. What does resourcing look like today for government um, government's trying to combat a what I would call an asymmetrical problem. In other words, it's cyber has never been a fair fight, never will be a fair fight. And so how does that impact the threat landscape? How does that impact our, you know, our resourcing? Because they only need to be lucky once, you need to be lucky forever. And that's, that's a pretty big problem. So uh, we can build out the whole thing if we want, that's fine, rather than saying next after every little box. Um, so first off on the threat landscape side, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. And for folks that work in security every day, I apologize if this is just a review um, for you, but we have many, many people, possibly upwards of a thousand on this call. And so we're just going to try to level set here for folks that may not be as deep into this on a day to day basis. So the attack volume is increasing, and I mean specifically in government. Um, if you look, depending on which report you look at, uh, the Verizon report, by the way, all the sources for this will be in the notes um, for the presentation when you get it. So a government is already number one or number two by industry. And if you take selected data points, the ransomware attacks in a particular location like the state of Florida can be as high as three quarters of all the ransomware attacks that are reported. So government is definitely being targeted. And so the attacks are on the increase in volume. 
the attacks are also being automated. Yay. Uh, and I, I struggled to come up with a more illustrative example than the one I have, which is a neo ransomware attack that occurred called Petya, which targeted financial institutions in this case, but this is becoming the high watermark where we saw we had boots on the ground and we saw 62,000 computers compromised and ransomware in under an hour. If that doesn't make you pause and think that the way we're approaching cybersecurity today with butts in seats, looking at too many screens, waiting for something to happen, um, something's going to have to change. Uh, also, uh, the Solargate uh, uh, debacle that we've all been reading about recently is illustrative of another point, which is where there is increased funding there is increased attack sophistication and scope. So nation, you know, obviously this was a nation state uh, sponsored attack. And whereas those used to be very surgical, they're finding that they can now work in a broader scope. They are now they now have the bandwidth to be able to do human led ransomware attacks as opposed to automated ones, which, which doesn't counter my my the, the previous point about needing to get more automation into how we respond. Uh, to me, it's just it's a scope thing. Uh, is the most important takeaway. Now, on the flip side, and there's so much more we could talk about in the threat landscape, but from a resourcing perspective in government, you know, it's it's always um, instructive to follow the money. So, um, and this is from uh, in the U.S. There's an organization called the Na National Association of State CIOs, uh, and they always produce great data on this front. And if you do a comparison between the percentage of IT spend that goes to security. In, by industry, it's pretty telling. So 28% spend percent spend in commercial, 16% in federal, 2% in states. Um, and again, source for that is in the notes. Um, and an additional point for the states is that only 18 out of 50 states actually have a line item in their budget for cybersecurity, uh, despite cybersecurity being the number one concern the last six years running in terms of NASIO surveys of state CIOs in terms of what they worry about. So that's interesting. Uh, another component, if you thought you were going to be throwing people at this problem, which as an aside would not work anyway with the asymmetrical nature of the problem. Um, so I've sat in front of state leaders, including governors, um, some very sort of tech savvy, forward thinking fund who had funded, you know, like 10, 20 uh, cybersecurity new heads. But then when you spoke to the CIO, what you found was that they were really struggling to actually find people and hire people because there's such a huge gap globally in cybersecurity talent and the ability to fill roles, including in commercial. And when you're going head to head with commercial for talent and it becomes a bidding war, government customers oftentimes will lose that bidding war and often. And so essentially to put it in pithy terms, funding does not equal finding, uh, especially in government these days. And finally, um, uh, you know, the, the best of breed approach that everybody's been using for the last 20 years, starting with when it was the only game in town. So, you know, no fault of anyone's. Um, we've ended up with 20 to 30 in government, different security solutions and vendors that we have to manage, tools we have to configure. A lot of them don't talk to each other for insight or response. Um, and so what you've ended up with is a ton of complexity, which has driven, in my opinion, the, the really not great security outcomes like low single digit investigation rates for the alerts that people see. Um, so, you know, 5%, some customers tell me 2.5%, et cetera, is what their teams have the bandwidth to actually go chase down. And so that's a huge problem and um, in terms of security outcomes. Um, so what is the end game for government customers then? In our opinion, um, and I don't have too many customers argue with me when we propose this, at least at a theoretical level, is we got to automate the boring and we got to automate the essential. And we're going to spend a little bit more time defining what we mean by automation and what we don't mean. Um, but that's sort of quickly, uh, in a nutshell, sort of the, the, the greatest hits of the threat landscape and resourcing landscape we see today for state and local government. Excuse me, for government in general. It's, mm -hmm. I don't think it would be incorrect for other branches of government. So if we go to the, the next slide, yep. So, so what we're going to do, and and that was a lot already in the first ten minutes of our our conversation. But let's I'll talk so faster let's, next time. Yeah, let's start <laughs> with the the approach for today. 
uh, as our our customers and governments start to make that that move towards modernization. So the ever changing security landscapes driving th this transformation with our customers. And for us, it it starts with this conversation around consolidation. Uh, we need to drive risk reduction, and we need to to start reducing the the points of risk. And that's uh, that that is delivered by taking a more modern approach to delivering the different services that that our customers are putting together. Next is that that integration level, and and that's where we're we're talking about driving the need for the security tools to be truly aware of each other, and, and be interconnected to drive a, a more correlated and more importantly a more coordinated response. Uh, and the last bit is uh, automation, and and that's where uh, when we we're going to talk uh, uh, definitely a lot more about uh, automation, but how automation is quickly becoming the most critical component of driving that secure modernization for, for our customers and, and gives us the ability to offset the deficiencies that often exist in terms of the, the resourcing and the, the ability to, to get the, those uh, individuals and, uh, and alerts and events and, and those different things taken care of. We were actually gonna present this slide in like a, a circular motion and, and what we realized when we were doing our prep for this is just that, that there is an order of, of, of uh, delivery here. There's an order of operation, and this is something that's going to get done uh, by workload, and you're going to have to continue to go through this process workload by workload. That's why we have that lather, rinse, repeat. So if we can go to the, the next slide. So when we, we talk about this consolidating data center operations, so why are we starting with, with consolidation? Well, it, it starts with that common first action that our customers are taking with the cloud and lots of customers start in that cloud data center modernization with lifting and shifting picking up servers and bringing them uh, into their cloud provider and when we we see customers use that lift and shift approach of course they should be combining that with that spring cleaning that is crucial to ensuring that you're yep. only bringing the things you know up to the cloud that that need to be brought to the cloud but as you open these new doors uh, you're opening new opportunities from a compliance perspective and it also opens the opportunity from a network design, from a delivery perspective, uh, to connect and use tools that are a little bit more evergreen, that are always growing. Uh, and with that that uh, increase in, in potential things like integration and, and other capabilities, they affect your ability to adjust compliance as the compliance environment in that landscape uh, continues to change. With platform as a service, that, that's another significant opportunity to reduce some, and it's something I'll say multiple times today is reduce points of risk. And, and that's moving uh, and, and driving service towards this platform as a service because it lets you start to offload some of those points of risk, some of that responsibility to vendors like Microsoft. But more importantly, it allows you con to convert that focus more on the delivery of services and away from the day-to-day -day operational tasks that often have those security uh, holes that that might exist or those those increase in security risks and that network and compliance that I mentioned previously also gets improved because you continue to narrow the the scope of delivering those different services. Uh, the last thing that I, I I'm, I'm mentioning uh, in this this slide is that control plane and when you you talk about modernizing that control plane, it's talking about having a single delivery of policy and governance regardless of the way that you're delivering that so whether you're on-prem whether you're in microsoft's cloud or another vendor's cloud or a co-location or dr site or whatever that might be having that single control plane and having that that uh that that thing that a lot of my customers when they're they're looking for is is a reduction in the overall management tools this each of those different tools and having to be a a, a, a guru an expert in every one of those different tools itself is a risk. So, uh, Dean, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on on that, but jumping into the the next slide, if you can hit the the build a couple times, it's going to bring a few uh, bring a few arrows up. But uh, one of the things that that we see, and I it, again, when we were doing prep, I was saying, well, some customers may have that, and I feel like every customer I talk to, when when we look behind the scenes in their environment, we step through what it is that they've got. This is, is an example of, of what their environment is. And if we took an email, for example, and tracked it through their environment, there's all these different uh, security landscapes that exist and there's an inconsistency in the visibility. And when you look at that, 
this this image that's up on the screen, one of the things that jumps out to me is complexity. And if you think about that attack kill chain that that you know is was stepped through very quickly in the uh, the the build out there, we know that these attacks can sometimes take weeks, sometimes take months to execute. We know that the the process of detecting uh, and, and responding successfully to these attacks is a slow process. And because there's all these different groups, there's all these different technologies, there's all these different resources, it slows down the ability to deliver. And it it oftentimes when you have this type of complexity behind the scenes, you've got significant orchestration that has to take place. You've got uh, a significant amount of point solutions that are in place that you oftentimes are trying to make work together when they really weren't designed to. And that that creates seams, if you will, in the in in the overall strategy, and things start to slip through the cracks. Yeah, Dennis, I would add to that. Um, so as somebody who started in the federal cybersecurity space and kind of been in and out of cyber for 20 years, you know, if for so long the classical defense in depth strategy or mantra has been drilled into everybody's heads. But I feel like there's a dirty little secret or historically there's been a dirty little secret, which is that, you know, most of these layers in the defense in depth layered model never spoke to each other. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it didn't take attackers long to figure that out. And so when we're talking about seams, one of the big seams that attackers have exploited for a long time is that lack of coordinated insight, coordinated response, because all these layers were, OK, well, I'm on one layer and I only know what's going on with my layer. And, you know, if, if, if the outer wall gets breached, nobody's going to tell me. And so I'm, my behavior is not going to change, et cetera. Anyway, but I don't, I don't want to belabor the uh, yeah. analogy there, but. But it the defense in depth is it could bear could do with some improvement. Well, and that's where if you if we go to the the next slide, one of the the takeaways, and and this is not a a product conversation, as much as it is one of the the approaches that Microsoft has taken is reducing the number of points of risk uh, by creating a a unified approach to delivering the different services. And I'm not going to get into every nuance again. It's a 30 minute session. Uh, you know that that's in this slide, but when we we talk about how we're aligning those capabilities, it's around having the the different components in that those same layers that you you saw in the previous slide work together in concert. It, it, they're they're all designed to be able to interact, work with each other. So in that that approach where there is that defense in depth, the defense in layers, there's communication that's taking place. There's integration that's taking place. Uh, along the, those different le levels. So whether it's things like Azure Defender or our, our SIEM system, they're all interconnected. They're all built with a purpose in mind uh, of being able to create that, that connectivity. And that actually uh, blends into the, the, the slide that is next is where when we, we, we talk about that next point, we're talking about uh, building out that, that integration model. When we talk about integration, we, we can see how in, in the, the previous uh, slides where when there's products operating independently, it creates those seams and coverage. Those seams become expensive over time also as the, the lack of correlation means more and more is invested in trying to connect the dots between these systems. So integrated products isn't just about saying, you know, Microsoft, you know, has this integrated solution uh, and, and we're doing that just because it's convenient. It's designed to actually do everything from lower the, the overall cost of delivery, but that increased awareness, awareness between the products actually also reduce the points of risk. And it also creates a more singular delivery of incidents instead of noise into the different alerting systems that exist. And when we talk about that native integration, it, it's it's saying, look, there are vendors like Microsoft, and when you're you're making this decision to start to modernize your approach to security in in our government data centers, it's around working with vendors who who have invested in creating this not you know not just the credible platform, but the story and the the delivery behind it, and that's where that that shift towards this integrated approach decreases those different silos that are out there. And that exists, and it starts to create a, a process where innovation is the driver uh, from a platform perspective. And the last, and I'm, I'm going to save time here for Dean to be able to, to to have some commentary. But the last is this: it takes a village. Microsoft has uh, has created a, a, an intelligent security association, 
And this is one of those things where if we we had one or two security vendors uh, to connect in the intelligence, the security intelligence community, that would be great. But we actually have hundreds, and that was a Herculean task uh, to get there. And Dean, I know you wanted to, to have some commentary, so I'm going to pause and let you jump in. Uh, yeah, can we go back, please? Not that there's a lot. You can actually see much on the slide. but <laughs> So I feel like this ecosystem point is one that could easily be glossed over in a presentation like this, and yet I think it is essential to address. Obviously, what we're kind of talking about here is over time, folks moving to a platform security strategy as opposed to best of breed. Um, and the first usual rebuttal that you get to that or concern is I need this to be with a bunch of different vendors so that there isn't one vulnerability to take down all this stuff and I want to keep this stuff and I have expertise in this area. There's a, a, a different varieties, but the, the what is compelling about the the MISA, the Microsoft Intelligence Security Association, is we have this global, we're going to talk about the ISG in a bit, uh, but we have this global threat intelligence database in the, in the cloud, eight trillion feeds a day. Just mind-blowingly enormous um, and, and uniquely valuable asset. So much so that when we announced the this partner program, it's basically what it is, I think three three years ago, eh, we, may be, we may be announced with 10 partners. I think it was like this week, three years ago at Ignite. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Um, now we're 200 plus, and I have to believe that that is because of the unique asset that is this giant threat intelligence database that people want to plug into because they realize even if they have a competing product and you can go look in the appendix for all the competitors and co-competitors um, that we have that have all found it compelling enough to plug into and join this association and historically for folks that have been in cyber for a long time i would i would assert that there has never been the critical mass to have a compelling association alliance where there should naturally be that because the industry is so fragmented etc people are very nervous about their ip and, and and all that kind of stuff anyway so we don't have time for this but the point being that you can bring your existing vendors they are already voting with their feet to join this alliance and that might you know, mean you don't have to move all your stuff and you could still participate in the ecosystem where this tool, this database is making everybody connected to it smarter. Sorry, I probably took too long for that, but. Uh, can we go to the, the next slide? So one of the areas that if you want to, if you think Dean was passionate before and, and any of his other delivery, automation is probably his most passionate, but very, very quickly, there's a couple things up on, on the screen. Everyone has and starts with, with policy. There's all these security baselines that everybody sets, which is, is great. And when, when Dean jumps in here in a second, as soon as I, I, I get through my, my bullet points, he's going to give you a, a number of different analogies and scenarios. But when, if, if you think about our moment in time past policy, and you think about all the diverse signals that, that we have, has there ever been a moment in time where we are more connected? Everyone's doorbell has video. Every, everybody has sensors all over their, their home for their, the temperature and the different things that they do. So we're, we're collecting more and more signals from more and more locations. So policies just don't cut it because we're absorbing more data, more signals, more information from more sources than ever before. And that's where having this diverse source of artificial intelligence and that integrated with things like the 3,500 plus security professionals, the billion dollars that we invest annually in, in, in research and development as it relates to security. That's where all those layers come to bear and this artificial intelligence and machine learning aspect creates and gives you security resources that didn't exist inside of your environment before. And I know, Dean, you want to talk a little bit more about the, this automation topic because I know it's super passionate for you. Yeah, I should say at the outset, we had way more Game of Thrones references planned <laughs> than we actually used today. <laughs> Um, but the, I think the one of them is apt um, uh, for the first box, which is, you know, what does policy really mean? Yes, at some level, it's security baseline, so that you're pushing standard, uh, often standards-driven um, compliance policy and settings down to every machine equally and evenly. Um, that's great, but that's the wall. You also need poly dynamic policy-based detection and response, so, you know, conditional access um, to all authentications where you're dynamically assessing risk every time somebody tries to authenticate is an example of that. 
Um, so you need the wall and you need the watcher on the wall, right? Um, and and so that's a, to me, that's an important distinction that baseline policy is great, but you will always have to have a dynamic mind purvey or sort you know surveying that wall to make sure it hasn't been breached uh, through some unforeseen situation. De Dennis, did you want to talk a bit about threat intel before I jump into AI? No, I, I the the rest is you. I'll I'll, I'll close it up. Okay, at the end. I, I've already talked about the big brain uh, in the cloud. The reason why we 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 break out those speeds and feeds about the ISG is because when you're talking about um, and you know, a giant threat database is great, but especially at the size and volume we're talking about, there's no amount of humans that could make any sense or derive insights from that much data. All those 3,500 people that Dennis was talking about, if we had them do nothing but parse that database, they wouldn't have an insight for 200 years. Um, so you need to bring AI into the mix to separate the signal from the noise at cloud scale. And let me be more specific about what we mean by AI. We don't mean your humans writing scripts, trying um, to keep up with the threat and threat landscape that's out there. That is a losing proposition, in my opinion. Um, and what we're really talking about is automation that is led by AI, uses the massive database with the signal from the noise separated by AI, and you are training the AI to be better by giving it more data and more diverse feeds of data around security. And that's how you get to a place where you're willing to turn on the kind of automation that says, I trust the big brain in the cloud to make insight decisions, to make response decisions, et cetera, that are as good or better than my humans. And that's sort of the panacea that we're looking for um, in this kind of new, brave new world. And I'm not talking about human scripting stuff. That is a bottleneck all day long. Well, and Dean, you mentioned ISG, and I, I want to, we're acronym happy at Microsoft. We should mention that that is the intelligent security graph. I, I did um, reference that on the previous slide. Did you? Okay. Well, I'm sorry so about that. just joined, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can go to the, the one last slide. And in, 30 minutes in the 29 minutes we've had so far we are barely able to scratch that 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 surface in terms of this type of conversation so there are a, a couple things that that absolutely you should do after this session number one one of the things is schedule a secure score review with your account team that's something where the the team can connect with you review information that that uh, aligns in your existing environment if you're already running uh, Azure today, where we can talk about any potential risks that, that you may have inside of your environment. And again, engage in this conversation a little bit more. When it comes to, to this topic being part of your overall governance risk and compliance strategy, uh, Microsoft has the cloud adoption framework, and that's that uh, uh, there's a session in there that's a governance workshop that absolutely is something you should try to schedule. The last is you can try these the, some of our security tools for free. Connect with your product, or excuse me, your account team uh, to be able to try these products out. There are a couple links uh, baked in at the bottom there, and we really appreciate the time everyone has given us today. We yes, hope you have a great you. rest of your Ignite and and complete those reviews and enjoy the rest of your time at Ignite.